at the age of 19, I found myself not being able to work, not being able to drive, not being able to like get anything. So I had a lot of different obstacles, but I always remember what my father told me that the U.S. is the land of opportunity, but it is up to us to find it. So that is when I put all of my emphasis into just being resourceful and trying to find the solution to my current situations, you know? So I found out that I could, that even though I couldn't work as Diego Corzo, I could create my own company and I began doing websites for small, for small businesses, accounting stuff, uh, restaurants, and I was doing websites as a contractor because I created my own LLC. All right, guys, welcome again to another amazing episode. Today we have Diego Corzo. Uh, he's a millennial Forbes feature entrepreneur, dreamer, and DACA recipient who became financially free at the age of 26. Uh, from what I've seen, he's been on the Supreme, Supreme Court steps. Uh, he, he is, he's making it happen in real estate, despite all the, the challenges that life may have thrown at him, that, you know, policy has thrown at him. Um, and I think it's important to highlight fellow Latinos uh, as to how you can, you can succeed in this country through adversity, right? I, I think that's the American dream and he, he's making it happen. Um, even as a DAC, DAC recipient, right? So Diego, we're gonna jump right in and and um, tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, just your whole experience, kind of upbringing. Um, one one thing that I know from having friends that, that are dreamers um, is is just how was that experience getting yourself through college, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, for me, it started when. I was nine years old when my parents and I and my brother came to the United States from Lima, Peru. We came here with a tourist visa, but then my parents decided to overstate it. And that's when we became undocumented. And I didn't really understand what it really meant as a child until I turned 15 years old when it was my turn to get my driver's license. And I go to the DNB and they said that due to the, to the documents that I don't have, I am not able to get my driver's license. So that's when I knew that my life was going to be a little bit different than my friends. And then I, I put all my emphasis into high school. I graduated third in my high school class, got into college. And as I was applying for grants, for financial aid, all of that stuff, again, just like all my friends, I found out that I couldn't qualify for any of that because they either asked me for my green card or some kind of visa, or I had to be an American citizen. And unfortunately they didn't have that. So I did get a few scholarships and my parents had a little bit of money that were able to pay for me uh, for the first year. And while I began, while I was in college, I also found out at that time, I was volunteering at this nonprofit and they said, Diego, we want to hire you. So as I was going through the hiring process, I also found out that legally I couldn't work. So at the age of 19, I found myself not being able to work, not being able to drive, not being able to like get anything. So I had a lot of different obstacles, but I always remember what my father told me that the U.S. is the land of opportunity, but it is up to us to find it. So that is when I put all of my emphasis into just being resourceful and trying to find the solution to my current situations, you know? So I found out that I could, that even though I couldn't work as Diego Corzo, I could create my own company and I began doing websites for small, for small businesses, accounting stuff, uh, restaurants, and I was doing websites as a contractor because I created my own LLC. And that is how I was able to pay for college. I, will, I would ride my bike to appointments in the summer here in Florida with like a uh, suit in my backpack. But, uh, but at the end of the day, I just had to do what I had to do. And it wasn't until 2012 when the Obama administration passed the DACA program that yeah. finally allowed me to work and drive that at the age of 22, I was finally able to do that. So, and that happened just as I was graduating college. So as I was graduating, I started interviewing because I was finally going to be able to get a job. And I got a job as a software developer with General Motors. And that moved me to Austin when I was 22. Crazy stuff, man. So, you know, I remember because I came here when I was four, 
Uh, my mm-hmm. brother came here. We came from Colombia early on. He he was a uh, uh, 12, 13, I believe. And we were fortunate uh, that we received our, our citizenship uh, through our, our mother. And then I remember, like you said, right, figuring out when you were around 15, 16, oh my God, my friends, some of my friends, they can't go to college. They, they can't apply for uh, FAFSA. Um, you know, and, and I started seeing that and I, I didn't really, really understand that. And then later I realized I could have easily been in the same situation. Um, mm-hmm. It just, the pro, the process is obviously, I think is broken. Um, and and it, sometimes it's just luck. You end up on the wrong side of the coin. It just happens like that, which I think is important. I think you, you've been pushing for, for change uh, mm-hmm. in that. But so how did you, I think it's very resourceful that you created an LLC and started working through that LLC, even though you couldn't work yourself, but you started making that that company, which forced you to be an entrepreneur, correct? Exactly, exactly. And that yeah. that is what I actually like, what pushed me to be like, okay, what else can I do? Right, yeah. it just helped me become resourceful. That, that's amazing because most people are, are, you know, they try to be entrepreneurs, but you were forced into it. You, who wouldn't know? You might have never become an entrepreneur. So how did you, you know, how did your your family support you in that instance? And then, and then as you went through college, did you receive any help? How did that happen there? Yeah. So my family had, was always a huge support. And uh, fortunately, through college, I was able to get a couple of scholarships uh, that dealt more with my grades because I did get pretty good grades. I graduated in the top 1% of Florida State University. And uh, but I also in the resourcefulness, I also created study guides for people. And uh, so to give you an example, I took this class on physics and rocks. And uh, the teacher said, hey, if you know every, if you know the answers to these 20 questions, you will get an A in the exam. So I memorized them. I did the study guide and I got an A. So the next time that the teacher said that, I send an email out to all of the students in the class. And I was like, hey, guys, I was the one who said the curve. Um, I'm going to create a study guide. I will sell it to you for $10. And uh, it's going to give you all of the answers. I made 300 bucks the first, uh, I sold it for five bucks the first time, five bucks. And I made 300 bucks. By the second, by the third exam, I sold them for 10 bucks and I made $200 there. And uh, it was awesome because that income that I made through, through selling study guides paid for a couple of my for my, for my classes. classes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. So that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And it was always trying to get resourceful, you know, like instead of buying new books, I would find books on Amazon or I would find friends that had already taken that class. And I was like, Hey dude, can I borrow this for a semester? And they're like, yeah, sure. So yeah. buying books on Amazon and then s- selling them again, that was uh, one of the ways that, that I definitely was able to still afford college. Man, that, that's crazy, man. So, so let, let's move a little bit forward here. You know, you, yeah. um, you were, you know, you transitioned from corporate to, to real estate at this point. And at, by mm-hmm. this point, you were already a, a DACA, you were in the DACA program, right? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, what sparked that bug into real estate, right? Cause you were, you were in the corporate world, you mm-hmm. know, what, what, what bothered you about it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, it was interesting because I had read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, while I was in college. And that book taught me two things, that you can either trade your time for money or you can make your money work for you. So I knew that no matter what, even though I was going to have a good salary job, um, making good income at the age of 23, 22 years old, I knew that no matter what, I wanted to live below my means so that I can invest my money for passive income. So that was the goal. When through that angle, I began because I wanted to invest in real estate. I met a realtor who was trying to help me buy a house so that I could house hack. House hack basically means buying a single family home, living in the master, renting out three rooms, for example, and having your tenants pay for 
your rent. I mean, pay for the mortgage yeah. or buying a duplex, triplex, quadplex, live on one side while renting the other. So I was trying to do that. And because I was so new because of DACA, I didn't have credit. I like the lenders had no idea what DACA was. I had a deal that fell through two weeks before closing because again, they were asking for my green card. And I'm like, I told you from the beginning, I don't have it. And they're like, well, then how are you here? And I'm like, it's part of the DACA program. And I don't um, know what it is. Yeah, yeah. At this point, this is 2013. They had no idea. Yeah. So, um, but I was able to finally in 2014, figure it out, find a lender. And I was able to buy my first property to house hack, putting down 5% down. My mortgage payment was $13.50 and my, the income that I was coming in from my three roommates was $16.50. So I was able to basically with $8,000, because that was the down payment, with $8,000, I was able to buy my house, live for free, and the extra income that was coming from my tenants also pay for my car. So that's, that's how it's been since I've been 24. Other people have been paying for my living expenses. And then I just repeated the process again and again to the point that now I have four properties in Austin, Texas, uh, with one more under contract. I have nine or 10 Airbnbs in Tennessee. And then I own some properties in Florida as well. Nice, man. That's really good. That's really good. And then you obviously got into Airbnb, short-term rental. That is one of the areas I, I'm not 100% comfortable with, but I, I mm. have certainly a number of friends that are making a killing of it. And uh, that yeah. is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So let me let me ask you, how did you, you know, from there, how did you expand? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what actionable steps could you tell people? Because obviously a lot of people face the same issues as far as, hey, how do I convince a lender or how do I find a broker you know you had extra challenges because you were they they were like you can't get this right so yeah how do, exactly. how, do you, how do you make that happen yeah so basically for me what what is really important especially for the people here too the audience I feel like it's really important to know that when you're starting out you need to have the right team Right. You need to have your investor friendly realtor if you're looking to buy an investment property. Uh, and you also need a like the right lender to be able to qualify for for the right loans. So having the right team is step number one. Um, step number two, of course, is choosing your strategy and sticking to it. And then number three is just taking the time to analyze deals. I feel like that's super important. And a lot of people feel like they don't pull the trigger because they're not either analyzing enough deals or then they also, they don't have the right team. But I always believe too, that as you're trying to get started, you should also find some kind of mentor or some kind of podcast just like this that will allow you to, to continue to learn and to at least have a conversation, even if, even if it's one way, right? But it gives you some content that you can listen to other people and then uh, be able to take action once it's needed. But it's really important to just take the first step because if not, you're going to be stuck in analysis paralysis. Yeah, or the education loop. Um, mm -hmm. you know, yes, that is very that. true but never take an action, right? Yeah, and that that's interesting because right now it's super easy to just get on that education, right? Like you go to seminars and like, because yeah. of COVID now they're all webinars over the weekend and you can watch that and you, then you listen to podcasts and then you yeah. just go on Zoom calls. But if it's, if you're never taking action at the end of the day, that just becomes entertainment. And it sucks yeah. to say that, but you could have spent your time watching the Harry Potter series and, and if you're, because you're not taking any action on it, it just makes you feel good. But at exactly. the end of the day, you're not seeing the results in your life. Exactly. And I, I, I mean, you're spot on, man. That, that's one of the reasons I, I tell people is set a goal for how much learning you want to do, apply what you learned, mm -hmm. take action. Because I mean, I want you to listen to my podcast. Don't get me wrong, but I prefer that you take a nugget here and go make something happen. Because I've been there, you know, I, I've been, you know, podcasts and you're like, oh, this is great. And then, you know, a week goes by and you're like, 
but what about me? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just like inspiration, yeah. right? But you need, you, you want to, mm -hmm. you can get inspired, but you definitely need to have that extra, that extra steps. So what does real estate mean to you, you know, and, and should everyone invest in real estate? Yeah. So I believe for, okay. So real estate for me, it means something that is tangible. It's something that I can touch and it's an an asset that has the opportunity to bring income into my pocket. That is the best way to see it. And to answer your question on the, do you think that everyone, everyone should own real estate? I would say yes. There's a lot of people like Grant Cardone that says, hey, don't buy your, your home or even in Rich Dad Poor Dad at the end of the day, that book says, hey, your house, if you're not renting, if it's not making you money, it's a liability. But I would say that at the end of the day, I would have stayed at my house, the one that I bought for 170. Yeah. And now it's worth 250. And I could have either rented, continue to rent, continue to rent, and I'm paying somebody else's mortgage if I rent. So I would prefer many times over to just buy my first house and live in there and build on the equity and pay off the principal because at the end of the day, it's something that you have. Exactly. I, I completely agree. I think, I think there's, there's extremes, right? You want to be centered in the middle and make sure that you're, you're investing. Well, you're, you're taking care of yourself, right? It's something for you. Mm -hmm. You need to have something for you, you know? And then, so as you've gone through this experience, you know, I saw in your, in your other, uh, on your LinkedIn profile, you did a lot of volume as a realtor, you know, yeah, you, you crushed it, man. So tell us a little bit about that experience and what made you so successful. What do you think yeah. was, happened there? Right. Yeah. So I've been doing, so after I tried to buy my first house that I couldn't get it because it, I, it got turned away. Right. It got, I had to terminate the contract. I, the, the realtor that was helping me, I began to, I became his friend and he became my mentor. So I got my license in 2014. By 2015, I went, I quit my job. I quit my corporate America job with, with General Motors. And I went all into real estate full-time as a realtor. Since then, now fast forward five years later in 2020, I sold 56 homes last year uh, with probably giving out like 10 or 15 referrals. So if you think about it, that can sort of like equal like 70 deals too, if you think about it that way. Yeah. But I've sold 56 homes in the Austin area and it's been great. I have, uh, I have an office manager slash transaction coordinator. I have a buyer's agent that helped me with, with a few of those deals right now. And, uh, and it's been great. Now, the main thing for me in, for my business is I've been super blessed that everything has been through referrals. And that's because the mentor that I was learning from, he was also working through referrals. So I picked my niche and my niche was house hackers, was millennials. Cause at that point, right. I was 23, 24 years old. I did not know anybody in Austin back then, and uh, but only the people at my job. So I bought a house and I began to teach other people how I did it, and uh, and that's how I got started. And then after that, I began to be featured on podcasts. And fortunately, Austin has been booming. So um, so as I've shared my story a little bit more and more and more on podcasts on like mm -hmm. Forbes and giving my TEDx, more people have heard about me. And then when they think, when they look at Austin and they know that I'm here, they recommend me. So it's been great. Social media, having that, uh, instead of being a salesperson, like salesy on stuff, I just yeah. educate people through my Instagram, through my Facebook. So fortunately I don't spend any money on the marketing side, like on yeah. like uh, websites or to get leads. I just do it organically and it's worked out pretty well. That's awesome, man. That's really, congrats on all that. All that Thank success. you. That, that's really huge. So let, let me ask you, what is the situation now with, with DACA and, and your family too? I imagine they're, mm -hmm. they're in the same boat. Are they, is there any resolution coming forward on that or? 
So with DACA, um, I'm hopeful that the next administration, um, that they will be able to do something for us to find a solution for the long term, rather than just saying, hey, like, because the last four years have been a roller coaster, right? It's been, a, hey, we're going to take it away. No, we're not. Now we're going to go to the judge. Now we're going to go to the Supreme Court. And uh, and so it's been a roller coaster of like of emotions. Right yeah. now, as we're filming this, my DACA documents were set to expire last Sunday because uh, we renew it every two years. Nice. So oh, fortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was such a relief because like I have employees, like I have like I have stuff to do. I, I, I had to, I had to buy a car before the end of the year so that, so that I could, um, so that it wouldn't be an issue if my DACA documents didn't come. I had to buy a couple of homes. And like, if anything happened to the, to the way that it extended past my yeah. DACA and my DACA documents didn't, didn't, uh, didn't get here on that. time, I would have been screwed. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, I mean, fortunately it came right on time. Uh, but there was, there was definitely that, that scare of like me being able, like my, my license was expiring yeah. and all this other stuff. Yeah. No, no, man. Well, I'm rooting for, for that to, to change quick and, and to make it happen. I know, I know yeah. it's probably been a roller coaster the whole time because I know also during during the Obama administration, I mean, there was a period there where they weren't sure in the second term. And I was like, why, you know, make something permanent, you know? Yeah, just exactly. Stop, exactly. Stop. That guy's just a little dangle. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. It is. And it's with it being, fair. and with it being like taken, getting taken away or this and that, um, yeah. I used it as a way like all this roller coaster of emotions, right? And this goes for just anybody. Like in life, no matter what kind of challenges you're going through, you can either see it as a way that is going to set you back, or you can ask yourself, how can this work for me, right? Like yeah. how can I best take advantage of the situation? So with the Trump administration doing everything that they were doing, I shared my story on social media for the first time and this was back in 2017 or 2016 and that post went viral and uh, that that's why it got me on forbes and cnn money and entrepreneur.com and all this other stuff is because i took that sort of that obstacle that challenge and i'm like listen i am a dreamer i pay taxes i own by that time i owned like a properties as a 26 year old. So I was just like letting them know like, Hey, I am an asset to this country. DACA, reci DACA recipients yeah. contribute to our communities. And, uh, and yeah, so it's been, it's been a crazy journey. Um, but I feel like at the end of the day is what can I, like, how can I capitalize on whatever is going on? Because I can either become a victim or I can take the empowered mentality. And um, that's been my mindset through the whole thing. That's huge, man. That that is huge, right there. What you just said to the to the listeners, because you know, I was gonna ask you too. Is you know, have you had any resentment? And I'm sure you have here and there, because it's not an easy thing, right, against mm -hmm. the government. But I mean, what you just said kind of kind of sums it up. Even if you do, you learn mm -hmm. how to use it for either you make yourself a victim or you find a way to succeed, and you've done that, you know. That is, yeah. Yeah. That is, yeah. 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 And at the end of the day, I don't think there's like resentment. I mean, of course there is that sort of like, that sort of like, I don't agree with what they're doing, but mm -hmm. I've just decided to take action to the point that anything that they tell me is like, look at me, dude, like, like not to you, but, or, or like yeah, to yeah, the too. audience, but like to people that like, Cause when my post went viral, I got so many people telling me like, I got the haters, right? Like yeah, Diego, yeah. you're, if you're so smart, why didn't you find a way to get your citizenship? Even though you have yeah. all this, you're still illegal, go back to Peru. And like some people said, go back to Mexico. And I'm like, dude, I'm Peruvian. Yeah, like, nah, there man. were, there, there were like so many different comments and people that I, people, some, some high school friends that I hadn't spoken with in years, they would send me text messages 
And they're like, hey, Diego, how, how can you keep it so cool on social media when you have so many people hating on you? And I'm like, dude, I'm just going to educate them because at the end yeah. of the day, they just see one thing. They don't know from the perspective of the dreamers, like really what's happening. Yeah. And uh, so I've just taken, again, like that education hat on and try to educate them as much as I can and showing them with my results. And I'm not just like, there's 800,000 dreamers, right? So I'm in 800,000 DACA recipients. So at the end of the day, I am just one single story, but there's so many like myself who it's sort of like we're doctors, teachers, realtors, yeah. whatever, you know, and we're all trying to live our own version of the American dream at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, I think as it's a natural human behavior to, you know, we try to have empathy or sympathy towards mm -hmm. people, but it unless we experience things ourselves, we tend to be very judgmental, you mm -hmm. know. And I think most people, people don't understand that experience you may have. And I, I, I just go ahead and say, you know, as as a kid who saw all that and was on the sidelines, but you know, wasn't was able to see that the people in limbo, I I can just tell you that it's a system that's broken. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. anyone's fault or anything, but it's just a broken immigration system mm -hmm. um, where we do need to fix and we need to find a permanent solution for to help these people that are in limbo. You know, it's, exactly. not, it's not fair for the, the people. I mean, it's not your fault that you came here to this country. Your parents brought you here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. It's, it's, like I said, you know, I really have a, a connection there because I could have been one of the, in the same situation, right? And it's it, it's just crazy to think about. So where where are you going now? Where's the where's your trajectory in real estate? Are you yeah. starting your own company? What what are you yeah. doing? Man? Yeah. So I've um so with me being able to share my sharing my dreamer story. Um, the more and more that I shared it, I realized that there were a lot of people that had reached out and they're like, Diego, how, how did you do it? I want to do it too. So I began to teach other millennials and especially dreamers, DACA recipients, but also Americans who I had random people reach out and like, dude, Diego, if you can do that as a dreamer, I can totally do it as an American. Can yeah. you teach me? And, uh, so, so what I've, uh, what I've been able to do, uh, this, well, not this year, but in 2020, I created a mastermind group with another guy named Felipe Mejia. Mm -hmm. Um, after being featured on the bigger pockets podcast, my dad post, like I got me like a thousand followers in one weekend on, on Instagram. And ever since then, I've just put a lot of focus on social media. And now we have a mastermind group called Rat Race to FI, where we're basically helping people get out of the rat race and going to financially independence. And it's through real estate, of course, because that's what I believe that it, it can totally happen if you yeah. commit to it for the next five or 10 years. And, uh, and that's what we teach. And at the end of the day, we teach that there are six different ways for there are six key areas for anybody that wants to achieve financial independence. And uh, number one is scheduling personal is scheduling personal development. Number two is managing your personal finances. Number three is connecting with the right peer group. And because your peer group is the one that sets that standard, right? Is the one yeah. that you, you need to get your average up. Um, Jim Rohn says that you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. So the level of conversations are the things that are going to pull you forward. So that's why your peer group is super important. Number four is goal setting with accountability. Number five is increasing your income through side hustles. And then number six is investing. And that's where we come in later. But if you don't have the mindset the strong enough mindset, if you don't have the right people in your life, the, the right peer group, if you don't have the right finances, then um, then investing in real estate is going to be really hard because there's going to be stuff that comes up. And if you don't have the right mindset, you're going to quit. And yeah. you might share with a family member, hey, I'm going to buy this house. And then they're going to be like, hey, but dude, I heard about this, this thing happened and you shouldn't do that. Are you yeah. sure that's risky? What if this happens? So there are some people that 
they don't know what they don't know. And uh, they will pull you away if you don't have the right peer group. So that's why it's super important to connect with like-minded people. And that's how we have been providing, especially to the Latino community, right? Yeah. Because I feel like not many, there's not that many minorities that are out there investing in real estate as much as other, as, yeah. as other people. Which, you know, is, is a noble cause and it's something that, that at least my brother and I were, were trying to do and we're starting up as well. Uh, mm -hmm. just with our experience. But let, let me ask you this, because our, our podcast is mainly geared towards uh, multifamily and more commercial. Um, cool. Where, you know, that's most of our audience are, are transitioning from single family residential to commercial. You know, for, for you, you know, mm -hmm. have you thought about maybe going into multifamily, JVing, syndication? When I mean multifamily, I mean, you know, five plus units, apartment buildings, et cetera. Yeah. So that's actually where, where I'm going. I've, uh, uh, awesome. I became, uh, I became an, an accredited investor last year. So the goal is going to be to start investing into some syndications this year. Awesome. Um, yeah. More, more as an LP for sure. Okay. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to go out there and and like try to find apartment buildings and try to raise money. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to be more the silent investor. And um, so, yeah, so I'm excited about that. That's awesome, going to be man. something that, that I'm going to get the right education on this year and start pulling the trigger. Awesome, man. Yeah. And that's, that's great to, uh, to know you're doing that. that that's our, our world and what we try to focus on. And what, what brings you into that space? What attracted you? Um, it's just playing at a higher level, I guess, like di diversifying too. Like I have, I have like the 10 Airbnbs. I have a few properties in Austin. I I'm in the middle of a 1031 exchange from a quadplex to another quadplex. And, um, right now is just, I feel it's the next thing to do to yeah. continue making my money work in a way that that it's sort of like the big boys play, I feel. I completely agree, man. And that's why in our show, we try to tell people, because I think it comes to exposure. Um, I was never exposed to a larger commercial and, and true force appreciation mm -hmm. that that can really happen in, in that commercial world is ridiculous. And I think mm -hmm. syndications, all that is something that the Latino community it's not really exposed to, right? Like I think we've been exposed a lot to now house hacking and mm -hmm. all these different strategies, but I see all the real wealth building in that area. And I'm like, we need to be in that as well. You know? Exactly. Exactly. To, yeah, yeah. So that's a passion of mine. Yeah. And how old are you, by the way? 31. 31. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, cool. You? I, get, I just turned 30 this year. Well, oh, awesome. <laughs> last year in 2020. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're around the same age, man. Yeah. 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 I, I went into the military for, you know, right after high school and been doing that since, you know. Okay. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for your service. No, I appreciate it, man. But yeah, Diego, thank you so much, man. Can you tell the audience where they can find you or your social media as you already mentioned your mastermind, mention it again, you know, anyway. Yeah. Before. Yeah, for sure. So Instagram will be the best way will be real Diego Corzo. So that's at real Diego Corzo and they can check out the website ratrace2fi.com and they can reach us through there as well. Awesome, man. All right. Well, Diego, again, thank you for, for coming on and, and we'll have the same touch, brother. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Take care.